Edward I of England. Edward I, also known as Edward Longshanks and the Hammer of the Scots, was King of England from 1272 to 1307. The first son of Henry III, Edward was involved early in the political intrigues of his father's reign, which included an outright rebellion by the English barons. In 1259, he briefly sided with the baronial reform movement, supporting the provisions of Oxford. After reconciliation with his father, however, he remained loyal throughout the subsequent armed conflict, known as the Second Baron's War. After the Battle of Lewes, Edward was hostage to the rebellious barons, but escaped after a few months and joined the fight against Simon de Montfort. Montfort was defeated at the Battle of Eversham in 1265, and within two years the rebellion was extinguished. With England pacified, Edward left on a crusade to the Holy Land. The crusade accomplished little, and Edward was on his way home in 1272 when he was informed that his father had died. Making a slow return, he reached England in 1274 and he was crowned king at Westminster on August 19. He spent much of his reign reforming royal administration and common law. Through an extensive legal inquiry, Edward investigated the tenure of various feudal liberties, while the law was reformed through a series of statutes regulating criminal and property law. Increasingly, however, Edward's attention was drawn towards military affairs. After suppressing a minor rebellion in Wales in 1276-77, Edward responded to a second rebellion in 1282-83 with a full-scale war of conquest. After a successful campaign, Edward subjected Wales to English rule, built a series of castles and towns in the countryside and settled them with Englishmen. Next, his efforts were directed towards Scotland. Initially invited to arbitrate a succession dispute, Edward claimed feudal suzerainty over the kingdom. In the war that followed, the Scots persevered, even though the English seemed victorious at several points. At the same time there were problems at home. In the mid-1290s, extensive military campaigns required high levels of taxation, and Edward met with both lay and ecclesiastical opposition. These crises were initially averted, but issues remained unsettled. When the king died in 1307, he left to his son, Edward II, an ongoing war with Scotland and many financial and political problems. Edward I was a tall man for his era, hence the nickname Lonshanks. He was temperamental, and this, along with his height, made him an intimidating man, and he often instilled fear in his contemporaries. Nevertheless, he held the respect of his subjects for the way he embodied the medieval ideal of kingship as a soldier, an administrator and a man of faith. Modern historians are divided on their assessment of the king, while some have praised him for his contribution to the law and administration, others have criticized him for his uncompromising attitude towards his nobility. Currently, Edward I is credited with many accomplishments during his reign, including restoring royal authority after the reign of Henry III establishing Parliament as a permanent institution and thereby also a functional system for raising taxes, and reforming the law through statutes. At the same time, he is also often criticized for other actions, such as his brutal conduct towards the Scots, and issuing the Edict of Expulsion in 1290, by which the Jews were expelled from England. The Edict remained in effect for the rest of the Middle Ages, and it would be over 350 years until it was formally overturned under Oliver Cromwell in 1656. Early Years Childhood and Marriage Edward was born at the Palace of Westminster on the night of 17th to 18th June 1239, to King Henry III and Eleanor of Provence, being named Edward of Westminster. Although the young prince was seriously ill on several occasions, in 1246, 1247, and 1251, he grew up to be strong and healthy. Edward was in the care of Hugh Gifford, father of the future Chancellor Godfrey Gifford, until Bartholomew Peck took over at Gifford's death in 1246. Among his childhood friends was his cousin Henry of Almain, son of King Henry's brother Richard of Cornwall. Henry of Almain would remain a close companion of the prince, both through the civil war that followed, and later during the Crusade. In 1254, 
English fears of a Castilian invasion of the English province of Gascony induced Edward's father to arrange a politically expedient marriage between his 14-year-old son and Eleanor, the half-sister of King Alfonso X of Castile. Eleanor and Edward were married on November 1, 1254 in the Abbey of Santa Maria la Real de las Hulgas in Castile. As part of the marriage agreement, the young prince received grants of land worth 15,000 marks a year. Though the endowments King Henry made were sizable, they offered Edward little independence. He had already received Gascony as early as 1249, but Simon de Montfort, 6th Earl of Leicester, had been appointed as royal lieutenant the year before and, consequently, drew its income, so in practice Edward derived neither authority nor revenue from this province. The grant he received in 1254 included most of Ireland, and much land in Wales and England, including the earldom of Chester, but the king retained much control over the land in question, particularly in Ireland, so Edward's power was limited there as well, and the king derived most of the income from those lands. From 1254 to 1257, Edward was under the influence of his mother's relatives, known as the Savoyards, the most notable of whom was Peter of Savoy, the queen's uncle. After 1257, Edward increasingly fell in with the poet Evan or Lusignan faction, the half-brothers of his father Henry III, led by such men as William de Valence. This association was significant, because the two groups of privileged foreigners were resented by the established English aristocracy, and they would be at the center of the ensuing years' baronial reform movement. There were tales of unruly and violent conduct by Edward and his Lusignan kinsmen, which raised questions about the royal heir's personal qualities. The next years would be formative on Edward's character. Early Ambitions Edward had shown independence in political matters as early as 1255, when he sided with the Sola family in Gascony, in the ongoing conflict between the Sola and Colom families. This ran contrary to his father's policy of mediation between the local factions. In May 1258, a group of magnates drew up a document for reform of the king's government, the so-called Provisions of Oxford, largely directed against the Lusignans. Edward stood by his political allies and strongly opposed the provisions. The reform movement succeeded in limiting the Lusignan influence, however, and gradually Edward's attitude started to change. In March 1259, he entered into a formal alliance with one of the main reformers, Richard de Clare, Earl of Gloucester. Then, on October 15, 1259, he announced that he supported the Baron's goals, and their leader, Simon de Montfort. The motive behind Edward's change of heart could have been purely pragmatic. Montfort was in a good position to support his cause in Gascony. When the king left for France in November, Edward's behavior turned into pure insubordination. He made several appointments to advance the cause of the reformers, causing his father to believe that his son was considering a coup d'état. When the king returned from France, he initially refused to see his son, but through the mediation of the Earl of Cornwall and the Archbishop of Canterbury, the two were eventually reconciled. Edward was sent abroad, and in November 1260 he again united with the Lusignans, who had been exiled to France. Back in England, Early in 1262, Edward fell out with some of his former Lusignan allies over financial matters. The next year, King Henry sent him on a campaign in Wales against Lywell and Ap Gruffard, with only limited results. Around the same time, Simon de Montfort, who had been out of the country since 1261, returned to England and reignited the baronial reform movement. It was at this pivotal moment, as the king seemed ready to resign to the baron's demands, that Edward began to take control of the situation. Whereas he had so far been unpredictable and equivocating, from this point on he remained firmly devoted to protecting his father's royal rights. He reunited with some of the men he had alienated the year before, among them his childhood friend, Henry of Almain, and John de Warren, Earl of Surrey, and retook Windsor Castle from the rebels. Through the arbitration of King Louis IX of France, an agreement was made between the two parties. This so-called mess of Amiens was largely favorable to the royalist side, and laid the seeds for further conflict. Civil War 
the years 1264 to 1267 saw the conflict known as the Second Barons' War, in which baronial forces led by Simon de Montfort fought against those who remained loyal to the king. The first scene of battle was the city of Gloucester, which Edward managed to retake from the enemy. When Robert de Ferrers, Earl of Derby, came to the assistance of the rebels, Edward negotiated a truce with the Earl, the terms of which he later broke. Edward then captured Northampton from Montfort's son Simon, before embarking on a retaliatory campaign against Derby's lands. The baronial and royalist forces finally met at the Battle of Lewes, on May 14, 1264. Edward, commanding the right wing, performed well, and soon defeated the London contingent of Montfort's forces. Unwisely, however, he followed the scattered enemy in pursuit, and on his return found the rest of the royal army defeated. By the agreement known as the Miss of Lewis, Edward and his cousin Henry of Almain were given up as prisoners to Montfort. Edward remained in captivity until March, and even after his release he was kept under strict surveillance. Then, on May 28, he managed to escape his custodians and joined up with the Earl of Gloucester, who had recently defected to the king's side. Montfort's support was now dwindling, and Edward retook Worcester and Gloucester with relatively little effort. Meanwhile, Montfort had made an alliance with Llywelyn and started moving east to join forces with his son Simon. Edward managed to make a surprise attack at Gnilworth Castle, where the younger Montfort was quartered, before moving on to cut off the Earl of Leicester. The two forces then met at the second great encounter of the Barons' War, the Battle of Eversham, on August 4, 1265. Montfort stood little chance against the superior royal forces, and after his defeat he was killed and mutilated on the field. Through such episodes as the deception of Derby at Gloucester, Edward acquired a reputation as untrustworthy. During the summer campaign, though, he began to learn from his mistakes, and acted in a way that gained the respect and admiration of his contemporaries. The war did not end with Montfort's death, and Edward participated in the continued campaigning. At Christmas, he came to terms with the younger Simon de Montfort and his associates at the Isle of Ecombe in Lincolnshire, and in March he led a successful assault on the Sink Ports. A contingent of rebels held out in the virtually impregnable Knilworth Castle and did not surrender until the drafting of the conciliatory dictum of Knilworth. In April it seemed as if Gloucester would take up the cause of the reform movement, and civil war would resume, but after a renegotiation of the terms of the dictum of Knilworth, the parties came to an agreement. Edward, however, was little involved in the settlement negotiations following the wars. At this point his main focus was on planning his upcoming crusade. Crusade and Accession Edward took the Crusaders' cross in an elaborate ceremony on June 24, 1268, with his brother Edmund and cousin Henry of Almain. Among others who committed themselves to the Ninth Crusade were Edward's former adversaries, like the Earl of Gloucester, though de Clare did not ultimately participate. With the country pacified, the greatest impediment to the project was providing sufficient finances. King Louis IX of France, who was the leader of the Crusade, provided a loan of about PS 17,500. This, however, was not enough. The rest had to be raised through a tax on the laity, which had not been levied since 1237. In May 1270, Parliament granted a tax of a twentieth, in exchange for which the king agreed to reconfirm Magna Carta, and to impose restrictions on Jewish money lending. On August 20 Edward sailed from Dover for France. Historians have not determined the size of the force with any certainty, but Edward probably brought with him around 225 knights and altogether less than 1,000 men. Originally, the Crusaders intended to relieve the beleaguered Christian stronghold of Acre, but Louis had been diverted to Tunis. The French king and his brother Charles of Anjou, who had made himself king of Sicily, decided to attack the emirate to establish a stronghold in North Africa. The plans failed when the French forces were struck by an epidemic which, on August 25, took the life of King Louis himself. By the time Edward arrived at Tunis, Charles had already signed a treaty with the Emir, and there was little else to do but return to Sicily. The crusade was postponed until next spring, 
but a devastating storm off the coast of Sicily dissuaded Charles of Anjou and Louis' successor Philip III from any further campaigning. Edward decided to continue alone, and on May 9, 1271 he finally landed at Acre. By then, the situation in the Holy Land was a precarious one. Jerusalem had fallen in 1244, and Acre was now the center of the Christian state. The Muslim states were on the offensive under the Mamluk leadership of Babers, and were now threatening Acre itself. Though Edward's men were an important addition to the garrison, they stood little chance against Babers' superior forces, and an initial raid at nearby St. George's Dalbin in June was largely futile. An embassy to the Ilkhanabakh, 1234-1282, of the Mongols helped bring about an attack on Aleppo in the north, which helped to distract Bayabar's forces. In November, Edward led a raid on Kakun, which could have served as a bridgehead to Jerusalem, but both the Mongol invasion and the attack on Kakun failed. Things now seemed increasingly desperate, and in May 1272 Hugh III of Cyprus, who was the nominal king of Jerusalem, signed a ten-year truce with Bayabas. Edward was initially defiant, but an attack by a Muslim assassin in June forced him to abandon any further campaigning. Although he managed to kill the assassin, he was struck in the arm by a dagger feared to be poisoned, and became severely weakened over the following months. It was not until September 24 that Edward left Acre. Arriving in Sicily, he was met with the news that his father had died on November 16. Edward was deeply saddened by this news, but rather than hurrying home at once, he made a leisurely journey northwards. This was partly due to his health still being poor, but also due to a lack of urgency. The political situation in England was stable after the mid-century upheavals, and Edward was proclaimed king at his father's death, rather than at his own coronation, as had until then been customary. In Edward's absence, the country was governed by a royal council, led by Robert Burnell. The new king embarked on an overland journey through Italy and France, where among other things he visited the Pope in Rome and suppressed a rebellion in Gascony. Only on August 2, 1274 did he return to England, and was crowned on August 19. Reign and Administration in the Law Upon returning home, Edward immediately embarked on the administrative business of the nation, and his major concern was restoring order and re-establishing royal authority after the disastrous reign of his father. To accomplish this, he immediately ordered an extensive change of administrative personnel. The most important of these was the appointment of Robert Burnell as Chancellor, a man who would remain in the post until 1292 as one of the king's closest associates. Edward then replaced most local officials, such as the escheaters and sheriffs. This last measure was done in preparation for an extensive inquest covering all of England, that would hear complaints about abuse of power by royal officers. The inquest produced the set of so-called hundred rolls, from the administrative subdivision of the hundred. The second purpose of the inquest was to establish what land and rights the Crown had lost during the reign of Henry III. The Hundred Rolls formed the basis for the later legal inquiries called the Quiwarranto Proceedings. The purpose of these inquiries was to establish by what warrant, Latin, Quiwarranto, various liberties were held. If the defendant could not produce a royal license to prove the grant of the liberty, then it was the Crown's opinion based on the writings of the influential 13th-century legal scholar Bracton, that the liberty should revert to the king. By enacting the Statute of Gloucester in 1278 the king challenged baronial rights through a revival of the system of general heirs, royal justices to go on tour throughout the land, and through a significant increase in the number of pleas of Quiwarranto to be heard by such heirs. This caused great consternation among the aristocracy, who insisted that long use in itself constituted license. A compromise was eventually reached in 1290, whereby a liberty was considered legitimate as long as it could be shown to have been exercised since the coronation of King Richard I, in 1189. Royal gains from the Quiwarranto proceedings were insignificant. Few liberties were returned to the king. Edward had nevertheless won a significant victory in clearly establishing the principle that all liberties essentially emanated from the crown. 
the 1290 Statute of Quo Warranto was only one part of a wider legislative effort, which was one of the most important contributions of Edward I's reign. This era of legislative action had started already at the time of the baronial reform movement. The Statute of Marlborough, 1267, contained elements both of the provisions of Oxford and the dictum of Kilworth. The compilation of the Hundred Rolls was followed shortly after by the issue of Westminster I, 1275, which asserted the royal prerogative and outlined restrictions on liberties. In the Mortmain, 1279, the issue was grants of land to the church. The first clause of Westminster II, 1285, known as De Donis Conditionalibus, dealt with family settlement of land, and entails. Merchants, 1285, established firm rules for the recovery of debts, while Winchester, 1285, dealt with peacekeeping on a local level. Kia Emptos, 1290, issued along with Quo Warranto, set out to remedy land ownership disputes resulting from alienation of land by sub -infeudation. The age of the great statutes largely ended with the death of Robert Burnell in 1292. Welsh Wars Lywell and Ap Gruffard enjoyed an advantageous situation in the aftermath of the Barons' War. Through the 1267 Treaty of Montgomery, he officially obtained land he had conquered in the four cantriffs of Perfidlad and was recognised in his title of Prince of Wales. Armed conflicts nevertheless continued, in particular with certain dissatisfied marcher lords, such as Gilbert de Clare, Earl of Gloucester, Roger Mortimer and Humphrey de Bowen, Earl of Hereford. Problems were exacerbated when Llywelyn's younger brother Daffod and Grufford ap Gwynynyn of Powys, after failing in an assassination attempt against Llywelyn, defected to the English in 1274. Citing ongoing hostilities and the English king's harbouring of his enemies, Llywelyn refused to do homage to Edward. For Edward, a further provocation came from Llywelyn's planned marriage to Eleanor, daughter of Simon de Montfort. In November 1276, war was declared. Initial operations were launched under the captaincy of Mortimer, Lancaster, Edward's brother Edmund, and William de Beecham, Earl of Warwick. Support for Llywelyn was weak among his own countrymen. In July 1277 Edward invaded with a force of 15,500, of whom 9,000 were Welshmen. The campaign never came to a major battle, and Llywelyn soon realised he had no choice but to surrender. By the Treaty of Abercorny in November 1277, he was left only with the land of Gwynedd, though he was allowed to retain the title of Prince of Wales. When war broke out again in 1282, it was an entirely different undertaking. For the Welsh, this war was over national identity, enjoying wide support, provoked particularly by attempts to impose English law on Welsh subjects. For Edward, it became a war of conquest rather than simply a punitive expedition, like the former campaign. The war started with a rebellion by Daffod, who was discontented with the reward he had received from Edward in 1277. Llywelyn and other Welsh chieftains soon joined in, and initially the Welsh experienced military success. In June, Gloucester was defeated at the Battle of Landy Lofau. On November 6, while John Peckham, Archbishop of Canterbury, was conducting peace negotiations, Edward's commander of Anglesey, Luke de Taney, decided to carry out a surprise attack. A pontoon bridge had been built to the mainland, but shortly after Taney and his men had crossed over, they were ambushed by the Welsh and suffered heavy losses at the Battle of Molwydon. The Welsh advances ended on December 11, however, when Llywelyn was lured into a trap and killed at the Battle of Orwyn Bridge. The conquest of Gwynedd was complete with the capture in June 1283 of Daffod, who was taken to Shrewsbury and executed as a traitor the following autumn. Further rebellions occurred in 1287 August and, more seriously, in 1294, with five under Madog ap Llywelyn, a distant relative of Llywelyn ap Gruffard. This last conflict demanded the king's own attention, but in both cases the rebellions were put down. By the 1284 Statute of Rutlan, the Principality of Wales was incorporated into England and was given an administrative system like the English, with countries policed by sheriffs. English law was introduced in criminal cases, 
though the Welsh were allowed to maintain their own customary laws in some cases of property disputes. After 1277, and increasingly after 1283, Edward embarked on a full-scale project of English settlement of Wales, creating new towns like Flint, Aberystwyth, and Rhydlan. An extensive project of castle building was also initiated. The assignment was given to Master James of St. George, a prestigious architect whom Edward had met in Savoy on his return from the Crusade. Among the major buildings were the castles of Beaumaris, Carnarfon, Conny and Hylech. His programme of castle building in Wales heralded the introduction of the widespread use of arrow slits in castle walls across Europe, drawing on Eastern influences. Also a product of the Crusades was the introduction of the concentric castle, and four of the eight castles Edward founded in Wales followed this design. In 1284, King Edward's son Edward, later Edward II, was born at Carnarfon Castle. In 1301 at Lincoln, the young Edward became the first English prince to be invested with the title of Prince of Wales. Diplomacy and War on the Continent Edward never again went on crusade after his return to England in 1274, but he maintained an intention to do so, and took the cross again in 1287. This intention guided much of his foreign policy, until at least 1291. To stage a European-wide crusade, it was essential to prevent conflict between the greater princes on the continent. A major obstacle to this was represented by the conflict between the French House of Anjou ruling southern Italy, and the Kingdom of Aragon in Spain. In 1282, the citizens of Palermo rose up against Charles of Anjou and turned for help to Peter of Aragon, in what has become known as the Sicilian Vespers. In the war that followed, Charles of Anjou's son, Charles of Salerno, was taken prisoner by the Aragonese. The French began planning an attack on Aragon, raising the prospect of a large-scale European war. To Edward, it was imperative that such a war be avoided, and in Paris in 1286 he brokered a truce between France and Aragon that helped secure Charles' release. As far as the Crusades were concerned, however, Edward's efforts proved ineffective. A devastating blow to his plans came in 1291, when the Mamluks captured Acre, the last Christian stronghold in the Holy Land. After the fall of Acre, Edward's international role changed from that of a diplomat to an antagonist. He had long been deeply involved in the affairs of his own Duchy of Gascony. In 1278 he assigned an investigating commission to his trusted associates Otto de Grandson and the Chancellor Robert Burnell, which caused the replacement of the seneschal Luc de Taney. In 1286, Edward visited the region himself and stayed for almost three years. The perennial problem, however, was the status of Gascony within the Kingdom of France, and Edward's role as the French king's vassal. On his diplomatic mission in 1286, Edward had paid homage to the new king, Philip IV, but in 1294 Philip declared Gascony forfeit when Edward refused to appear before him in Paris to discuss the recent conflict between English, Gasson, and French sailors, that had resulted in several French ships being captured, along with the sacking of the French port of La Rochelle. In the war that followed, Edward planned for a two-pronged attack. While the English forces focused on Gascony, alliances were made with the princes of the Low Countries, Germany, and Burgundy, who would attack France from the north. The alliances proved volatile, however, and Edward was facing trouble at home at the time, both in Wales and Scotland. It was not until August 1297 that he was finally able to sail for Flanders, at which time his allies there had already suffered defeat. The support from Germany never materialized, and Edward was forced to seek peace. His marriage to his first cousin once removed, Philip IV's half-sister Margaret, in 1299 ended the war, but the whole affair had proven both costly and fruitless for the English. The Great Cause the relationship between the nations of England and Scotland by the 1280s was one of relatively harmonious coexistence. The issue of homage did not reach the same level of controversy as it did in Wales. In 1278 King Alexander III of Scotland paid homage to Edward I, but apparently only for the lands he held of Edward in England. Problems arose only with the Scottish succession crisis of the early 1290s. 
In the years from 1281 to 1284, Alexander's two sons and one daughter died in quick succession. Then, in 1286, King Alexander died himself, leaving as heir to the throne of Scotland the three-year-old Margaret, the maid of Norway, who was born in 1283 to Alexander's daughter Margaret and King Eric II of Norway. By the Treaty of Birram, it was agreed that Margaret should marry King Edward's then one-year-old son Edward of Carnarvon, though Scotland would remain free of English overlordship. Margaret, by now seven years of age, sailed from Norway for Scotland in the autumn of 1290, but fell ill on the way and died in Orkney. This left the country without an obvious heir, and led to the succession dispute known to history as the Great Cause. Even though as many as fourteen claimants put forward their claims to the title, the real contest was between John Balliol and Robert de Brasse. The Scottish magnates made a request to Edward to arbitrate in the dispute. At Birham, with the prospect of a personal union between the two realms, the question of suzerainty had not been of great importance to Edward. Now he insisted that, if he were to settle the contest, he had to be fully recognized as Scotland's feudal overlord. The Scots were reluctant to make such a concession, and replied that since the country had no king, no one had the authority to make this decision. This problem was circumvented when the competitors agreed that the realm would be handed over to Edward until a rightful heir had been found. After a lengthy hearing, a decision was made in favor of John Balliol on November 17, 1292. Even after Balliol's accession, Edward still continued to assert his authority over Scotland. Against the objections of the Scots, he agreed to hear appeals on cases ruled on by the Court of Guardians that had governed Scotland during the Interregnum. A further provocation came in a case brought by Macduff, son of Malcolm, Earl of Fife, in which Edward demanded that Balliol appear in person before the English Parliament to answer the charges. This the Scottish King did, but the final straw was Edward's demand that the Scottish magnates provide military service in the war against France. This was unacceptable. The Scots instead formed an alliance with France and launched an unsuccessful attack on Carlisle. Edward responded by invading Scotland in 1296 and taking the town of Berwick in a particularly bloody attack. At the Battle of Dunbar, Scottish resistance was effectively crushed. Edward confiscated the Stone of Destiny, the Scottish Coronation Stone, and brought it to Westminster, deposed Balliol and placed him in the Tower of London, and installed Englishmen to govern the country. The campaign had been very successful, but the English triumph would only be temporary. Finances, Parliament and the Expulsion of Jews Edward I's frequent military campaigns put a great financial strain on the nation. There were several ways through which the king could raise money for war, including customs duties, money lending and lay subsidies. In 1275, Edward I negotiated an agreement with the domestic merchant community that secured a permanent duty on wool. In 1303, a similar agreement was reached with foreign merchants, in return for certain rights and privileges. The revenues from the customs duty were handled by the Riccardi, a group of bankers from Lucca in Italy. This was in return for their service as money lenders to the crown which helped finance the Welsh Wars. When the war with France broke out, the French king confiscated the Riccardi's assets, and the bank went bankrupt. After this, the Frescobaldi of Florence took over the role as money lenders to the English crown. Another source of crown income was represented by England's Jews. The Jews were the king's personal property, and he was free to tax them at will. By 1280, the Jews had been exploited to a level at which they were no longer of much financial use to the crown, but they could still be used in political bargaining. Their usury business, a practice forbidden to Christians, had made many people indebted to them and caused general popular resentment. In 1275, Edward had issued the Statute of the Jury, which outlawed usury and encouraged the Jews to take up other professions. In 1279, in the context of a crackdown on coin clippers, he arrested all the heads of Jewish households in England and had around 300 of them executed. In 1280, he ordered all Jews to attend special sermons, preached by Dominican friars, with the hope of persuading them to convert, but these exhortations were not followed. 
The final attack on the Jews in England came in the Edict of Expulsion in 1290, whereby Edward formally expelled all Jews from England. This not only generated revenues through royal appropriation of Jewish loans and property, but it also gave Edward the political capital to negotiate a substantial lay subsidy in the 1290 Parliament. The expulsion, which was not reversed until 1656, followed a precedent set by other European territorial princes. Philip II of France had expelled all Jews from his own lands in 1182. John I, Duke of Brittany, drove them out of his duchy in 1239. And in the late 1240s, Louis IX of France had expelled the Jews from the royal de Messon before his first passage to the east. Among the main achievements of the reign of Edward I were the reforms of the institution of the English Parliament and its transformation into a source for generating revenues. Edward held Parliament on a reasonably regular basis throughout his reign. In 1295, however, a significant change occurred. For this Parliament, in addition to the secular and ecclesiastical lords, two knights from each county and two representatives from each borough were summoned. The representation of commons in Parliament was nothing new. What was new was the authority under which these representatives were summoned. Whereas previously the commons had been expected simply to assent to decisions already made by the magnates, it was now proclaimed that they should meet with the full authority, plena potestas, of their communities, to give assent to decisions made in Parliament. The king now had full backing for collecting lay subsidies from the entire population. Lay subsidies were taxes collected at a certain fraction of the movable property of all laymen. Whereas Henry III had only collected four of these in his reign, Edward I collected nine. This format eventually became the standard for later parliaments, and historians have named the Assembly the Model Parliament. Constitutional Crisis The incessant warfare of the 1290s put a great financial demand on Edward's subjects. Whereas the king had only levied three lay subsidies until 1294, four such taxes were granted in the years 1294-97 raising over P.S. 200,000. Along with this came the burden of prizes, appropriation of food, seizure of wool and hides, and the unpopular additional duty on wool, dubbed the Multolt. The fiscal demands on the king's subjects caused resentment, and this resentment eventually led to serious political opposition. The initial resistance was not caused by the late taxes, however, but by clerical subsidies. In 1294, Edward made a demand of a grant of one half of all clerical revenues. There was some resistance, but the king responded by threatening without glory, and the grant was eventually made. At the time, the Archbishopric of Canterbury was vacant, since Robert Winchelsea was in Italy to receive consecration. Winchelsea returned in January 1295 and had to consent to another grant in November of that year. In 1296, however, his position changed when he received the papal bull Clericis Lycos. This bull prohibited the clergy from paying taxes to lay authorities without explicit consent from the Pope. When the clergy, with reference to the bull, refused to pay, Edward responded without glory. Winchelsea was presented with a dilemma between loyalty to the king and upholding the papal bull, and he responded by leaving it to every individual clergyman to pay as he saw fit. By the end of the year, a solution was offered by the new papal bull Etsy de Statue, which allowed clerical taxation in cases of pressing urgency. Opposition from the laity took longer to surface. This resistance focused on two things, the king's right to demand military service, and his right to levy taxes. At the Salisbury Parliament of February 1297, Roger Bigard, Earl of Norfolk, in his capacity as Marshal of England, objected to a royal summons of military service. Bigard argued that the military obligation only extended to service alongside the king. If the king intended to sail to Flanders, he could not send his subjects to Gascony. In July, Bigard and Humphrey de Bowen, Earl of Hereford and Constable of England, drew up a series of complaints known as the Remonstrances, in which objections to the extortionate level of taxation were voiced. Undeterred, Edward requested another lay subsidy. This one was particularly provocative, because the king had sought consent only from a small group of magnates, 
rather than from representatives from the communities in Parliament. While Edward was in Winchelsea, preparing for the campaign in Flanders, Bigard and Bowen turned up at the Exchequer to prevent the collection of the tax. As the king left the country with a greatly reduced force, the kingdom seemed to be on the verge of civil war. What resolved the situation was the English defeat by the Scots at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. The renewed threat to the homeland gave king and magnates common cause. Edward signed the Confirmatio Cartram, a confirmation of Magna Carta and its accompanying Charter of the Forest, and the nobility agreed to serve with the king on a campaign in Scotland. Edward's problems with the opposition did not end with the Farkirk campaign. Over the following years he would be held up to the promises he had made, in particular that of upholding the Charter of the Forest. In the Parliament of 1301, the King was forced to order an assessment of the royal forests, but in 1305 he obtained a papal bull that freed him from this concession. Ultimately, it was a failure in personal that spelt the end of the opposition against Edward I. Bowen died late in 1298, after returning from the Farkirk campaign. As for Bigard, in 1302 he arrived at an agreement with the king that was beneficial for both. Bigard, who had no children, made Edward his heir, in return for a generous annual grant. Edward finally got his revenge on Winchelsea in 1305, when Clement V was elected pope. Clement was a Gasson sympathetic to the king, and on Edward's instigation had Winchelsea suspended from office. Final years, return to Scotland. The situation in Scotland had seemed resolved when Edward left the country in 1296, but resistance soon emerged under the leadership of the strategically gifted and charismatic William Wallace. On September 11, 1297, a large English force under the leadership of John de Warren, Earl of Surrey, and Hugh de Cressingham was routed by a much smaller Scottish army led by Wallace and Andrew Murray at Stirling Bridge. The defeat sent shock waves into England, and preparations for a retaliatory campaign started immediately. Soon after Edward returned from Flanders, he headed north. On July 22, 1298, in the only major battle he had fought since Eversham in 1265, Edward defeated Wallace's forces at the Battle of Falkirk. Edward, however, was not able to take advantage of the momentum, and the next year the Scots managed to recapture Stirling Castle. Even though Edward campaigned in Scotland both in 1300, when he successfully besieged Calaverock Castle and in 1301, the Scots refused to engage in open battle again, preferring instead to raid the English countryside in smaller groups. Furthermore the defeated Scots, secretly urged on by the French, appealed to the Pope to assert a claim of overlordship to Scotland in place of the English. His papal bull address to King Edward in these terms was firmly rejected on Edward's behalf by the Baron's Letter of 1301. The English managed to subdue the country by other means, however. In 1303, a peace agreement was reached between England and France, effectively breaking up the Franco-Scottish alliance. Robert the Bruce, the grandson of the claimant to the crown in 1291, had sided with the English in the winter of 1301-02. By 1304, most of the other nobles of the country had also pledged their allegiance to Edward, and this year the English also managed to retake Stirling Castle. A great propaganda victory was achieved in 1305 when Wallace was betrayed by Sir John de Menteith and turned over to the English, who had him taken to London where he was publicly executed. With Scotland largely under English control, Edward installed Englishmen and collaborating Scots to govern the country. The situation changed again on February 10, 1306, when Robert the Bruce murdered his rival John Cummin and a few weeks later, on March 25, had himself crowned King of Scotland by Isabel, sister of the Earl of Buchan. Bruce now embarked on a campaign to restore Scottish independence, and this campaign took the English by surprise. Edward was suffering ill health by this time, and instead of leading an expedition himself, he gave different military commands to Aymer de Valence and Henry Percy, while the main royal army was led by the Prince of Wales. The English initially met with success. On June 19, Aymer de Valence routed Bruce at the Battle of Mpfen. Bruce was forced into hiding, while the English forces recaptured their lost territory and castles. 
Edward responded with severe brutality against Bruce's allies. It was clear that he now regarded the struggle not as a war between two nations, but as the suppression of a rebellion of disloyal subjects. This brutality, though, rather than helping to subdue the Scots, had the opposite effect, and rallied growing support for Bruce. In February 1307, Bruce reappeared and started gathering men, and in May he defeated Ama de Valence at the Battle of Loudoun Hill. Edward, who had rallied somewhat, now moved north himself. On the way, however, he developed dysentery, and his condition deteriorated. On July 6 he encamped at Berg by Sands, just south of the Scottish border. When his servants came the next morning to lift him up so that he could eat, he died in their arms. Various stories emerged about Edward's deathbed wishes. According to one tradition, he requested that his heart be carried to the Holy Land, along with an army to fight the infidels. A more dubious story tells of how he wished for his bones to be carried along on future expeditions against the Scots. Another account of his deathbed seen as more credible. According to one chronicle, Edward gathered around him the Earls of Lincoln and Warwick, Aymer de Valence, and Robert Clifford, and charged them with looking after his son Edward. In particular they should make sure that Piers Gaveston was not allowed to return to the country. This wish, however, the son ignored, and had his favourite recalled from exile almost immediately. Edward I's body was brought south, and after a lengthy vigil he was buried in Westminster Abbey on October 27. The new king, Edward II, remained in the north until August, but then abandoned the campaign and headed south. He was crowned king on February 25, 1308. Character and Assessment Physically, Edward was an imposing man. At 6 feet 2 inches, 1 m, he towered over most of his contemporaries, and hence perhaps his epithet Lonshanks. Edward I by Michael Prestwich states his long arms gave him an advantage as a swordsman, long thighs won as a horseman. In youth, his curly hair was blonde. In maturity it darkened, and in old age it turned white. His speech, despite a lisp, was said to be persuasive. He also had a reputation for a fierce temper, and he could be intimidating. One story tells of how the Dean of St. Paul's, wishing to confront Edward over the high level of taxation in 1295, fell down and died once he was in the king's presence. When Edward of Carnarfon demanded an earldom for his favourite Gaveston, the king erupted in anger and supposedly tore out handfuls of his son's hair. Some of his contemporaries considered Edward frightening, particularly in his early days. The Song of Lewis in 1264 described him as a leopard, an animal regarded as particularly powerful and unpredictable. Despite these frightening character traits, however, Edward's contemporaries considered him an able, even an ideal, king. Though not loved by his subjects, he was feared and respected. He met contemporary expectations of kingship in his role as an able, determined soldier and in his embodiment of shared chivalric ideals. In religious observance he also fulfilled the expectations of his age. He attended chapel regularly and gave alms generously. Modern historians have been more divided in their view of Edward I. Bishop William Stubbs, working in the Whig tradition of historical writing, praised Edward as a king deliberately working towards the goal of a constitutional government. The self-regulating action of the body politic, according to Stubbs was very much the work of Edward. Stubbs' student T.F. Tout departed from this view. In Tout's opinion, even the parliamentary system grew up in obedience to the royal will. It was no yielding to a people crying for liberty, but the shrewd device of an autocrat, anxious to use the mass of the people as a check upon his hereditary foes among the greater baronage. F. M. Powick offered a more positive perspective in his extensive work on Edward I and King Henry III and the Lord Edward, 1947, and the 13th century, 1953. K. B. Macfarlane, on the other hand, criticized Edward's restrictive policy towards his earls, and concluded that he belonged less to the future than to the past. In 1988, Michael Prestwich released what has been called the first scholarly study devoted exclusively to the political career of Edward I. Prestwich's work, which is considered authoritative, 
tries to assess Edward by the standards of his own age, and concludes that his reign was a great one. His contributions to the development of the law, parliament and a functioning system of taxation, as well as his military exploits, stand out in particular. At the same time, he left a legacy of financial difficulties, political distrust and an unresolved situation in Scotland. The roots of the disasters of the reign of Edward II can be found in the reign of Edward I. Other contemporary writers have been more willing to criticize Edward for his failings, particularly his severe treatment of the Jews. There is also a great difference between English and Scottish historiography on King Edward G.W.S. Barrow, in his biography on Robert the Bruce, accused Edward of ruthlessly exploiting the leaderless state of Scotland to obtain a feudal superiority over the kingdom. This view of Edward is reflected in the popular perception of the king, as can be seen in the 1995 movie Braveheart's portrayal of the king as a hard-hearted tyrant. Name and Epithets Edward, being an Anglo-Saxon name, was not a common name among the aristocracy of England after the Norman conquest. Henry III was devoted to the veneration of Edward the Confessor, and for this reason decided to name his firstborn son after the saint. Other Anglo-Saxon kings had included Edward the Elder and Edward the Martyr. Regnal numbers were not commonly used in Edward's time. As the first post-conquest king to carry that name, he was referred to simply as King Edward, King Edward, son of King Henry, or King Edward, the first by that name after the conquest. It was only after the succession of first his son and then his grandson, both of whom bore the same name, that Edward I came into common usage. The epithet under which Edward I is best known is probably Long's Hanks meaning long legs, or long shins in reference to his tall stature. On May 2, 1774, the Society of Antiquaries opened Edward's tomb in Westminster Abbey. They reported that his body had been well preserved over the preceding 467 years and measured the king's body to be 6 feet 2 inches, 188 centimeters. At this length, he would tower over most of his common contemporaries. Another epithet applied to Edward I's Hammer of the Scots. This comes from the Latin inscription on his tomb, which reads Edwardus Primus Scotorum Malus Icist, 1308. Pactum Serva, here is Edward I, Hammer of the Scots, 1308. Keep the vow. This inscription, however, referring to his incessant campaigns against the Scots in the later years of his reign, is from a later date, probably the 16th century. The 17th century lawyer Edward Coke called Edward the English Justinian. This was a way of highlighting the king's legislative accomplishments, by comparing him to the renowned Byzantine lawmaker Justinian I. Unlike Justinian, Edward did not codify the law, but as William Stubbs pointed out, if it be meant to denote the importance and permanence of his legislation and the dignity of his position in legal history, the comparison is still a valid one. Issue Eleanor of Castile died on November 28, 1290. Uncommon for such marriages of the period, the couple loved each other. Moreover, like his father, Edward was very devoted to his wife and was faithful to her throughout their married lives a rarity among monarchs of the time. He was deeply affected by her death. He displayed his grief by erecting twelve so-called Eleanor crosses, one at each place where her funeral cortege stopped for the night. As part of the peace accord between England and France in 1294, it was agreed that Edward should marry Philip IV's half-sister Margaret. The marriage took place in 1299. Edward and Eleanor had at least fourteen children, perhaps as many as sixteen. Of these, five daughters survived into adulthood, but only one boy outlived Edward, the future King Edward II. Edward I was reportedly concerned with his son's failure to live up to the expectations of an heir to the crown, and at one point decided to exile the prince's favorite Piers Gaveston. By Margaret, Edward had two sons, both of whom lived into adulthood, and a daughter who died as a child. The Highlys Abbey Chronicle indicates that John Botetourt may have been Edward's illegitimate son. However, the claim is unsubstantiated. Notes Morris 2008, pages 22, as the sources give the time simply as the night between 17 and 18 June, 
we can not know the exact date of Edward's birth, Morris 2008, pages 2, A B C D E F G H I Prestwich, 2004, Prestwich 1997, pages 5 to 6, Prestwich 1997, pages 46, 69, Morris 2008, pages 14 to 8, Morris 2008, pages 20, Prestwich 1997, pages 10, Prestwich 1997, pages 7 to 8, Prestwich 1997, pages 11 to 4, Prestwich 2007, pages 96, Morris 2008, pages 7. Henry III's mother Isabella of Angouleme married Hugh X of Lugignan after the death of King John. Prestwich 2005, pages 94. Prestwich 2007, pages 95. Prestwich 1997, pages 23. Prestwich 1997, pages 15 to 6. Carpenter, David, 1985. The Lord Edward's Oath to Aid and Counsel Simon de Montfort. October 15, 1259. Bulletin of the Institute of Historical Research 58, 226-37 doi, 10.1111 per Joule 1468-2281.1985 TBO 1170X, Prestwich 1997, pages 31-2, Prestwich 1997, pages 32-3, Morris 2008, pages 44-5. Prestwich 1997, pages 34, Powick 1962, pages 171 to 2, Madcott 1994, pages 225, Powick 1962, pages 178, Prestwich 1997, pages 41, Prestwich 2007, pages 113. The First Baron's War was in 1215 to 1217. Prestwich 1997, pages 42 to 3, Sadler 2008, pages 55 to 69, Maddicott, John, 1983. The Miss of Lewis, 1264 inches. English Historical Review 98, 388, 588 to 603. JSTOR 569785, Prestwich 1997. Pages 47 to 8. This was Gilbert de Clare, son of the aforementioned Richard de Clare. Prestwich 1997, pages 48 to 9. Prestwich 1997, pages 49 to 50. Powick 1962, pages 201 to 2. Sadler 2008, pages 105 to 9. Morris 2008, pages 75 to 6. Prestwich 1997. Pages 55. The dictum restored land to the disinherited rebels, in exchange for a fine decided by their level of involvement in the wars. Prestwich 2007, pages 117. The essential concession was that the disinherited would now be allowed to take possession of their lands before paying the fines. Prestwich 2007, pages 121. Prestwich 1997, pages 63. Morris 2008, pages 83, 90-2, A.B. Prestwich 1997, pages 71, A.B. Prestwich 1997, pages 72, this meant a grant of one twentieth of all movable property, Maddicott, John, 1989. The Crusade Taxation of 1268-70 in the Development of Parliament. In Pierre Coss and S. D. Lloyd, Eds. 13th Century England 2. Woodbridge, Boyd L. Press pages 93-117. ISBN 0-85115-513-8. Morris 2008, pages 92. Riley Smith 2005, pages 210. The disease in question was either dysentery or typhus. Riley Smith 2005, pages 210-1. Riley Smith 2005, pages 211, Prestwich 1997, pages 75, Morris 2008, pages 95, Prestwich 1997, pages 76, Avenair Falk, Franks and Saracens, Reality and Fantasy in the Crusades, July 2010, pages 192, Morris 2008,
pages 97 to 8, Prestwich 1997, pages 77. The anecdote of Queen Eleanor saving Edward's life by sucking the poison out of his wound is almost certainly a later fabrication. Prestwich 1997, pages 78. Other accounts of the scene have Eleanor being led away weeping by John de Vesey, and suggest that it was another of Edward's close friends, Otto de Grandson, who attempted to sucking the poison from the wound. Morris 2008, pages 101, Prestwich 1997, pages 78, 82, Prestwich 1997, pages 82. Though no written proof exists, it is assumed that this arrangement was agreed on before Edward's departure. Morris 2008, pages 104, Carpenter 2003, pages 466, Prestwich 1997, pages 82 to 5, Powick 1962, pages 226, Morris 2008, pages 116 to 7, Prestwich 1997, pages 92, Prestwich 1997, pages 93. The few surviving documents from the Hundred Rolls show the vast scope of the project. They are dealt with extensively in, Helen Cam, 1963. The Hundred and the Hundred Rolls, an outline of local government in medieval England, New Ed. London, Merlin Press, Morris 2008, pages 115. Among those singled out in particular by the Royal Justices was the Earl of Gloucester, who was seen to have encroached ruthlessly on royal rights over the preceding years. Sutherland 1963, pages 146-7, Sutherland 1963, pages 14, Powick 1962, pages 378-9, Sutherland 1963, pages 188, Sutherland 1963, pages 149, Brand, Paul, 2003. Kings, Barons and Justices, The Making and Enforcement of Legislation in Thirteenth-Century England. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press. ISBN 0-521-37246-1, Plucknet 1949, pages 29-30, Plucknet 1949, pages 94-8, Plucknet 1949, pages 140 to 4, Prestwich 1997, pages 280 to 1, Plucknet 1949, pages 45, 102 4, Prestwich 1997, pages 293, Carpenter 2003, pages 386, Morris 2008, pages 132, Davies 2000, pages 322 to 3. Prestwich 1997, pages 175, Prestwich 1997, pages 174 to 5, Davies 2000, pages 327, Powick 1962, pages 409, Lancaster's post was held by Payne de Shaworth until April. Powick 1962, pages 409, Prestwich 2007, pages 150. A. B. Prestwich 2007, pages 151, Powick 1962, pages 413, Davis, Rees, 1984. Law on National Identity in Thirteenth Century Wales. Inara Davis, R. A. Griffiths, I. G. Jones and K. O. Morgan, eds. Welsh Society and Nationhood. Cardiff, University of Wales Press pages 51-69. ISBN 0 7083 0890 2, Prestwich 1997, pages 188, Davies 2000, pages 348, Morris 2008, pages 180, Prestwich 1997, pages 191 2, Davies 2000, pages 353, Carpenter 2003, pages 510. Carpenter 2003, pages 511, Davies 2000, pages 368, Prestwich 1997, pages 216, Prestwich 1997, pages 160, Cathcart King 1988, pages 84, Cathcart King 1988, pages 83, 
Fryer 2003, pages 77, Phillips 2004. This title became the traditional title of the heir apparent to the English throne. Prince Edward was not born heir apparent, but became so when his older brother Alfonso died in 1284. Prestwich 1997, pages 126 to 7. Prestwich 1997, pages 326 to 8. Powick 1962, pages 252 to 3. Prestwich 1997, pages 323 to 5. Prestwich 1997, pages 329. Prestwich 1997, pages 304. Morris 2008, pages 204 to 17. Morris 2009, pages 265 to 70. Prestwich 1997, pages 392. Prestwich estimates the total cost to around PS 400,000. Prestwich 1972, pages 172. Carpenter 2003, pages 518. Prestwich 1997, pages 357. Barrow 1965, pages 3 to 4. Prestwich 1997, pages 361. Morris 2009, pages 235. Barrow 1965, pages 42. Morris 2009, pages 237. The term is an 18th century invention. Morris 2008, pages 253. Prestwich 2007, pages 231. Powick 1962, pages 601. Prestwich 1997, pages 361 to 3. Barrow 1965, pages 45. Prestwich 1997, pages 365. Even though the principle of primogeniture did not necessarily apply to descent through female heirs, there is little doubt that Balliol's claim was the strongest one. Prestwich 1997, pages 358, 367. Prestwich 1997, pages 370. Prestwich 1997, pages 371. Barrow 1965, pages 86 to 8. Barrow 1965, pages 88 to 91, 99. Barrow 1965, pages 99 to 100. Prestwich 1997. Pages 471 to 3. Prestwich 1997, pages 376. Harris 1975, pages 49. Brown 1989, pages 65 to 6. Prestwich 1997, pages 99 to 100. Brown 1989, pages 80 to 1. Prestwich 1997, pages 403. Prestwich 1997, p. Plate 14, Prestwich 1997, pages 344, Prestwich 1997, pages 344 to 5, Morris 2008, pages 86, Powick 1962, pages 322, A. B. Morris 2008, pages 170 to 1, Morris 2008, pages 226, Morris 2008, pages 226 to 8, Prestwich 1997, pages 345. Powick 1962, pages 513. Prestwich 1997, pages 346. Morris 2009, pages 226. Powick 1962, pages 342. Brown 1989, pages 185. Harris 1975, pages 41 to 2. Brown 1989, pages 70 to 1. Brown 1989, pages 71. The term was first introduced by William Stubbs. Morris 2008, pages 283 to 4. Prestwich 1972, pages 179. Harris 1975, pages 57. Prestwich 1997, pages 403 to 4. Winchelsea's consecration was held up by the protracted papal election of 1292-94. Powick 1962, pages 671. Powick 1962, pages 674. Powick 1962, pages 675. Prestwich 1997, pages 417. Prestwich 1997, pages 430. 
Harry Rothwell, ed. 1957. The Chronicle of Walter of Guisborough 89. London, Camden Society pages 289-90. Quoted in Prestwich 1997, pages 416, Prestwich 1972, pages 251, Harris 1975, pages 61, Prestwich 1997, pages 422. Powick 1962, pages 682, Prestwich 1997, pages 425, Powick 1962, pages 683, Prestwich 1997, pages 427, Prestwich 2007, pages 170. A full text of the Charter, with additional information, can be found at Jones, Graham. The Charter of the Forest of King Henry III. St. John's College, Oxford. Retrieved July 17, 2009. Prestwich 1997, pages 525-6, 547-8. Powick 1962, pages 697. Prestwich 1997, pages 537-8. Prestwich 2007, pages 175. Barrow 1965. Pages 123 to 6. Powick 1962. Pages 688 to 9. Prestwich 1997. Pages 479. Watson 1998. Pages 92 to 3. Prestwich 2007. Pages 233. Prestwich 2007. Pages 497. Prestwich 2007. Pages 496. Powick 1962. Pages 709 to 11. Watson 1998. Pages 211. Powick 1962. Pages 711 to 3. Barrow 1965. Pages 206 to 7. 212 3. Prestwich 2007. Pages 506. Prestwich 1997. Pages 506 to 7. Barrow 1965. Pages 216. Prestwich 1997, pages 507 to 8. Prestwich 1997, pages 508 to 9. Prestwich 2007, pages 239. Barrow 1965, pages 244. Prestwich 1997, pages 556 to 7. Prestwich 1997, pages 557. Morris 2008, pages 377. Barrow 1965, pages 246. Prestwich 2007, pages 179. Prestwich 2007, pages 177. Prestwich 1997, pages 552. Prestwich 1997, pages 24. Prestwich 1997, pages 559. Prestwich 1980, pages 41. Prestwich 1980. Pages 37. Stubbs 1880. Pages 111. Tout. T.F. 1920. Chapters in the Administrative History of Medieval England, The Wardrobe, The Chamber and the Small Seals E. Manchester, Manchester University Press. Pages 190. Macfarlane, K.B. 1981. The Nobility of Later Medieval England. London, Hambledon. Pages 267. ISBN 0-9506882-5-8. Denton, J. H. 1989. Review, Edward I. By Michael Prestwich. English Historical Review XCIX, 413, 981-4 doi, 10.1093-SCIV. 413.981. JSTOR 572793, Carpenter 2003, pages 566, Prestwich 1997, pages 567, Prestwich 1997, pages 558 to 65, Prestwich 1997, pages 565 to 6, Barrow 1965, pages 44, Tung Zelman, Alex Von, July 31, 2008. Brav Hart, Dancing Peasants, 
Gleaming Teeth and a cameo from Fabio. The Guardian, UK. Retrieved August 3, 2009, Morris 2008, PPXVXVI, Carpenter, David, 2007. King Henry III and St. Edward the Confessor, The Origins of the Cult. English Historical Review. CXXII, 498, 865-91 doi, 10.1093-SM214, Prestwich 1997, pages 566-7. The original report can be found in ILOF, J. 1786. An account of the body of King Edward I, as it appeared on opening his tomb in the year 1774. Archaeologiae, 386, 398 to 412, Carpenter 2003, pages 467, Morris 2009, pages 378 referring to the vow to avenge the rebellion of Robert Bruce, Prestwich 1997, pages 566, Stubbs 1880, pages 114, Morris 2008, pages 230 to 1. Prestwich 1997, pages 395-6, Powick 1962, pages 719. The information on Edward's children with Eleanor is based on Parsons, John Carmi, 1984. The year of Eleanor of Castile's birth and her children by Edward I. Medieval Studies XLVI, 245-65, Gorski 2004, War, Scott L. 2004. Thomas, 1st Earl of Norfolk, 1300-1338. Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. Oxford, Oxford University Press. doi, 10.1093-REF, ODNB-27196, War, Scott L. 2004. Edmund, 1st Earl of Kent, 1301-1330. Oxford, Oxford University Press. doi, 10.1093-REF, ODNB-8506, Parsons, John Carmi, 2004. Margaret, 1279? Minus 1318. Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. Oxford, Oxford University Press. doi, 10.1093-REF. ODNB 18046, 